Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Surviving Mold Podcast, where lives are restored and illness is defeated. You see what I did there? Or illness is defeated and lives are restored. Today we're going to be talking about the FLIR One camera. We're going to be talking about, are there any tools that you can use before you jump into the process of a dust test? Is this a sufficient tool to give you the information that you need to test your home? We're going to find out today, thanks to our friend Larry Schwartz. Larry, thanks again for being on the show. You're welcome. My pleasure. Really ha love having you on. <clears throat> All right, Larry. So what is a FLIR One camera? It's, I mean, help me understand. I mean, I know what it is, but for the listeners out there, what is a FLIR One sure. camera? First of all, FLIR is a company in Sweden that designs and builds infrared imaging equipment. And the acronym of their name stands for Forward Looking Infrared. They originally designed and still make a lot of equipment for the military, mm -hmm. like in the front of planes and such. The FLIR Ranger. The, the, mm -hmm. uh, so the whole thing Don't about... Don't ask me how I know that. It's classified. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing about infrared is, you know, we look and see things visually, and those are based on wavelengths of light that reflect to us that we see images. And you hear the term ultraviolet, and you hear the term infrared. Uh, infrared is a different wavelength of light that our eyes cannot detect by, by itself. And the theory behind it is that all objects that have temperature give off electromagnetic radiation. Mm -hmm. And at different temperatures, they give off different wavelengths of radiation. And for example, look at an incandescent light bulb. There's a little coil of metal in there, and it's not producing light. As you run electricity through it and it heats up and it starts to glow and you see light, you're now seeing visual light. But before it gets to that point, it's giving off a large amount of what we call infrared radiation. So the furniture in your house, your walls, are all giving off electromagnetic radiation in a field called infrared because it has temperature. And this infrared equipment can detect that and we see images visually on a screen that are based on the temperature of the object as opposed to its visual look. And we see things in there we call anomalies, but here's the deal with infrared for building science, is that when you have moisture in a material like inside a wall or moisture in a floor or a ceiling, that moisture is evaporating and the evaporation makes it cooler so we see a distinction of the shape and color of the object in the infrared camera based on its temperature. However, we're looking at temperatures on the surface. So if we see a cold anomaly on a wall that is the shape and such we think is a water intrusion, we want to verify it typically with a moisture meter. Now, most of you that buy an infrared device for your... your uh, your iPhone or cell phone... Like the FLIR one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have... You know, you generally don't have a moisture meter that you can verify that moisture because of that temperature difference. We often see things at junctions of walls and ceilings where cold or hot air from outside is coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be gaps of insulation that are in place that you may think is a, is a moisture anomaly. We actually uh, utilized a thermal camera in my business partner's house to do a class on thermal, and we found out that the entire front wall of his home was missing half of the insulation. Oh yeah, I see that kind of thing all the time. <laughs> Especially if you have a ceiling upstairs that's a sloped wall. Oh really? Yeah. Oh and man. And sometimes like a trade or pyramid ceiling. Oh man. You know, there's, there's typical gaps. So but, let me recap just really yeah. quick. So if I understand this correctly, the human eye can see uh, can see a, a large amount of light, but in the um, in the reference of the light spectrum, it's really only about one percent. And infrared light and hyperspectral light and uh, excuse me, hyperspectral is a camera you can use to look at certain types of light. But my point is, is that with these other sensors like thermal sensors, we can see a much wider array of light. Is that correct? Exactly. Awesome. Now here, here's where this is really useful. If you see temperature anomalies of cold surfaces, shapes like ink blots, maybe a blot where the, the shape continues like gravity taking it down the wall. Like a stalagmite. Yeah, like a stalagmite. <laughs> In your shower. <laughs> There's a good chance, you know, it might be a water issue, but it is, a lot of people misconstrue this. This is not a mold test. 
This is a test for if there might be water or, or moisture in a, in a surface or behind a surface, but it does not mean that you're measuring any degree of mold. However, where you have water in the right temperature range on most building materials, eventually mold may start to grow if conditions are right, or you may just get dry water stains. So what I'm hearing from you then is that this is good to detect water potentially, but obviously not a a uh, comprehensive solution because we don't have a water meter. Right. But it could be good potentially, let's say we're staying in a hotel room and we want to just make sure that there's not a lot of water damage, that we don't want to, you know, kind of, maybe we don't want to stay in that hotel room. Is this an adequate solution for someone on the go, for someone traveling? It will be a huge assist. It won't be 100%. Gotcha. And I think that's important to say to people, too, because yeah. long and the short of it, guys, is even if you do have a FLIR 1 camera, even if you do have a thermal infrared camera, it's not enough. You're still going to have to go out there and get the, the dust test, the, the Hermes or the Hermes test, correct? Hurts me, yeah. Hurts me, excuse me. I just have to remember that because mold hurts me. There you go. <laughs> I, I won't forget it that way, good, you know? Good, So I think it's really important for people to understand that. You know, I think it's important for people to realize that there is something that can help you kind of detect water, but it doesn't always mean it's mold. Correct. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Well, would you add anything to this, Larry? I mean, I think we kind of covered it. Uh, FLIR 1 is good, but not good enough. You should still do a dust test, but if you're on the go, it's probably good Yeah, I think, I think if you're the kind of person that, you know, you find symptomatic effects when you travel, when you're in hotel rooms, I think it would be a very good thing to do. Uh, you probably see it more in the walls unless you're on the top or maybe the floor or two under the top level. You probably won't see much on ceilings, but, uh, you know, you might check the walls in the washroom, the exterior. I mean, if you have it, look everywhere. Uh, you just brought up a good point. So if I'm in a hotel, let's say I'm in a 10-story building in a hotel, what, where in the hotel do you think is probably a good place to stay? I recommend somewhere in the middle level where ground floor, you may get a lot of incoming air from stack effect and negative pressure and what kind of surroundings are there. You may have windows, patio doors where you may get wind and a lot of outdoor influence at the ground level. I try would try avoid the very top levels where there may be <laughs> intrusion from the roof. And uh, somewhere in the middle, and I, I want to recommend one other thing. If you can, avoid the north side because in the winter, the sun is in the south. You tend to get more uh, condensation and mold issues and building envelopes and behind wallpaper on sides facing north. Gotcha. Wow, that's that's so on the south side. <coughs> Again. <coughs> I feel so bad for you, Paul. <coughs> I don't know what it is. Wish I could help you. Let me tell you, these kind of air conditioners aren't always cleaned well. They can definitely be in effect. Uh, say that again? These kind of through the wall conditioners and such when you're running air. Yeah. With the condensation. I got to tell you, if we did a sport trap air test coming out, it wouldn't be terrific. Uh. <coughs> I mean, like, I'm watering <coughs> my eyes, nose. Whoa. And it started Watch. when that air conditioner turned on. You'll go out of the room and you're going you're gonna to be better, you'll see. Yeah. I, I have a, uh, a Halls, I love these, I forgot what you call them. I got a throat drop that might give you some relief. Ugh. You just happen to have one, huh? Not going to yeah. drug me? <laughs> no, I'm not going to drug you. <laughs> it's like I have a hair. Yeah, I know. I know what that's like. I know. Uh, okay, I'm gonna take your halls. Uh, I've never coughed like this. Like it hurts. Like yeah, here. yeah, yeah. It's, it's all muscular from that. They call. I think they call these breezers. They're not. They're not menthol or anything like that. They might have a little menthol. Thank you very much, Larry. Ooh. Wow. 
Wow. All right. Here we go again. Second time. We had to do that. So obviously you can edit this stuff. Mm -hmm. I try to wait for wait for breaking points. That's why I like waited till you finished your sentence, and then I was like, "All right, I'm out of here." <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. Wow. Do you remember where we left off? Because that really got me good. I think we were talking about in the hotels uh -huh. about using the infrared. I mentioned about oh, washrooms, the north side, avoid the north side. Yep. Stay in the south side. All right, so I'll pick up from there. Wow. Well, Larry, so if I want to stay in a hotel, I want to be on the south side of the building, about halfway up, and try to avoid areas that are towards the top. And let me ask you a question. That brings up a good point. So you said you don't want to stay in rooms towards the top of the hotel because you can have seepage from the roof. Is there a good time of day to do or to use a thermal camera? Because whenever we're flying thermal cameras on the outside of buildings, it's always good to do these tests right around sunset because the day, like the sun is heat up the area and we can see the water evaporating. Am I getting here or something? You're smiling. Am I getting to a good place? You're, you're reminding <clears throat> me of some of the classroom training I've had on this. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like if you can examine, you, you know, the come top to my of, thermal of a class flat roof, like. you wait till sunset. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> if there's moisture in there, it holds the heat longer mm -hmm. and it'll show up Way much better. more pronounced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, very valid. Okay, so, so, all right, well, that answers that question. Well, on that bombshell, guys, you're going to want to check out a FLIR 1 camera if you are traveling, but it's, gonna, it's really not going to be enough if you're at home and you're trying to figure out if your home is mold-free. But anyway, on that note, that's going to do it for us today. Thanks again for watching the Surviving Mold Podcast. Don't be afraid to subscribe to the show and leave us a review to help other people find this show, get the information, and help themselves out. It's going to do it for us today, guys. Thanks for watching. <laughs>